Ms. Kuyan Zhang. Welcome to our virtual uh, expert panel. This is co-hosted by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of South Korea and Gangwon National University. Uh, my name is Kuyan Zhang and I'm an assistant professor of political science in Gangwon National University. Uh, I would like to start by wishing you and your families my personal best for your health and safety in these trying times. And also I would like to express my gratitude uh, to those who joined us all uh, all in the morning and late in the evening <laughs> in the Washington DC. So I'll go directly back to my role today, uh, which is to, to introduce two people representing their organization for their remarks. First, I would like to introduce uh, Director General uh, Seo Eun Ji for her welcoming remarks. Director General, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jung. Uh, uh, good morning. And to those from the United States, good evening. I'd like to begin by expressing my appreciation to all panelists, especially those who are joining at a rather inconvenient time. It is my great pleasure to meet you, albeit virtually. As a Director General of the Korean Pu Foreign Affairs, Director General for the Public Diplomacy of the Korean Foreign Ministry, I try to promote forums where experts and critical thinkers can come together to grapple with the challenging topics and to share their perspectives. This kind of dialogue is important as it brings insight and new ideas to the pool of knowledge which governments can benchmark in shaping foreign policies. Moreover, it fosters an environment for enhanced mutual understanding and cooperation, thereby enriching the people-to-people -people ties. Over seven decades, the ROK-US alliance has stood the test of time and the core of the alliance has remained straightforward the deterrence of war, and the promotion of peace and prosperity on the Korean Peninsula. These objectives run through the path of denuclearization of North Korea and the establishment of a permanent peace regime. In recent years, there have been ups and downs with North Korea, significant progress and tensions were stalemate. Nevertheless, for Korean people and government, the stakes are too high to be disheartened by setbacks and Korean government will continue its effort to prevent escalation and to create a space for dialogue and engagement with North Korea. The ROK-US relationship, which initially began as a military alliance, has now expanded into a multifaceted partnership infused by shared values of freedom, democracy, human rights, and rule of law. And recently, we demonstrate trust and coordination in fighting against COVID-19. The latest instance of the evolving partnership is joint statement announced last month on the decision to work together to create a safe, prosperous, and dynamic Indo-Pacific region through cooperation between Korea's new Southern policy and the United States Indo-Pacific strategies based on the principles of openness, inclusiveness, transparency, respect for international norms. Korean government's high officials are requesting Steve Began, U.S. Deputy Secretary of State, who is now making a farewell visit to Korea to play a visit bridging role so that those progress can be continued into the next U.S. Ad administration and further advance Korea-U.S. relations. In this context, I hope today's discussion being held at a time when the incoming Biden administration's foreign policy is being shaped, we serve as a great opportunity to hear insightful analysis and policy recommendations from leading experts on the challenges we face, how to overcome them together. I look forward to reach a productive discussion. Thank you very much, and please stay strong and safe all. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your welcoming remarks. Now, please welcome the moderator of today's panel, Dr. Woo jung -yeop. Dr. Woo, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Jung. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, today. And I hope uh, Kuyan puts me on the moderator role today because I'm older than her. And maybe <laughs> there's another reason for this. Uh, my, my first uh, role today is to introduce our uh, panel today. I'm really uh, honored to uh, moderate the session with these like experts. Uh, I just uh, introduce our panels with their name and the in institute affiliations without any specific order. Uh, we have uh, Jung Gu Yun of Gangwon National University, 
you may wave your hand. And Jessica Lee of Quincy Institute. Son Hanbyeol uh, from Korean National Defense University. Clint Work uh, from Stimson Center. Angli Farron, uh, Center for International Policy. Uh, Hong Mi Hwa, uh, Kungmin University. Jung Sung Chol of Myeongji University. Last but not least, uh, Sarah Molo, Seton Hall University. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, it's as uh, Director General So and the Kuyan mentioned that uh, this is a critical moment in the security issues on the Korean Peninsula because uh, we are going to see the transition in the U.S. administration and it's going to have like huge impact on the security environment of South Korea. So I think uh, this is a very meaningful session today to produce fruitful outcome uh, for the discussion. So uh, we've discussed what to discuss today with our panelists, and there are two topics that we are going to discuss. Our first topic is the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and the future of the ROK-US alliance. And the second issue is the alliance cooperation in traditional and non-traditional security area. So my first question goes to Kuyan and Angri. Uh, what do you think the position of the president-elect Biden and his transition team on the North Korea issue is? How will it be different from the Trump and Obama administrations? So why don't you first uh, start with uh, uh, Kuyan and maybe like four or five minutes. Kuyan, please. Well, the real difference would be uh, based on the level of sophistication of North Korea's missile and nuclear capability, and that's just because we have different administration. I think uh, the real change, uh, real differences will be based on the capability of North Korea, so how we can threat the stability of the international community. So, and also, uh, Obama, uh, Biden administration would consider the different security landscape uh, in the Northeast Asia or more broadly in the Pacific region, which makes Biden takes more coercive and more engaging uh, approach toward this region as well, which include North Korea. So, um, in my opinion, first difference would be the uh, in, in, in the sense, uh, United States have different approach uh, uh, compared to by, uh, Obama administration in the sense that you cannot have any time to take uh, like a strategic patience. Given the level of uh, sophistication of missile capability, which can reach the uh, United States continents in, a, uh, in any time, then uh, it becomes the priority of uh, Biden administration. But uh, given that there is a coronavirus situation, it will take time to rearrange their foreign policy priority. But uh, uh, given that this changes in security landscape, uh, North Korea will be the first priority for uh, Biden administration. And the second one is related uh, to the broader perception of Biden administration uh, toward this region. So uh, it has been pretty different and, and it has been much more worse than the Trump administration in the sense that the region is full of competition or sometimes decoupling and um, any types of crisis can any times can occur. So and also declining of democracy as well. And also tremendous number of people are suffering from COVID-19 with different degrees, which make it uh, more, uh, take more uh, differential approach uh, for the United States to uh, uh, maintain the stability of the regions. And in that context, as China becomes the foreign policy priority of the Biden administration, then so does North Korea, because they are looking at these two countries are kind of the problem. And it, 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 it's not like China can help this problem, uh, but they are kind of a uh, problem altogether towards the instability of these regions. And also, uh, Biden administration emphasized the norm and uh, value aspect of foreign policy, as he mentions that he will uh, uh, help, he will hold a uh, summit, uh, summit for the democracy uh, in, as, after he takes the administration. So normative approach toward North Korea uh, will be emphasized in terms of human rights and other stuff. So. I think uh, North Korea policy will be much more uh, kind of uh, not necessarily coercive, but it becomes more much harder for North Korea to negotiate with the United States. So I will stop here. Thank you, Guyan. Uh, Ang Lee, please. Hello. Uh, thanks very much for having me. Uh, so on on the 
Biden's approach is not fixed yet. Uh, it's apart from broad catch-all formulas such as principled diplomacy. Um, but there's strong hints that Biden will continue the, the core light motif of uh, U.S. policy on North Korea, which is to pressure the country until it lays down arms. Um, Biden nevertheless appears, in my view, closer to Obama than Trump in his overall vision. Uh, he visibly aims for conserving and stabilizing the status quo uh, rather than transforming, uh, in a certain way, the, the geopolitics of uh, the Korean Peninsula. What's interesting is that Biden did not put in question Trump's maximum pressure policy and actually appears to be searching for ways to expand it, uh, judging by his personnel choices. Uh, Anthony Blinken, uh, Biden's prospective Secretary of State, uh, repeated his hard line in an interview about two months ago. Uh, he said, quote, uh, we need to cut off uh, the North's various avenues and access to resources, something we're doing very vigorously at the end of the Obama-Biden administration, end quote. So, uh, so Blinken and, uh, and Jake Sullivan, also uh, Biden's prospective national security advisor, uh, have both emphasized the goal of convincing China to increase pressure on the North. Where Biden differs from Trump, in my view, is the return to a more uh, adversarial rhetoric, uh, familiar from the Obama era. On the campaign trail, Biden criticized summit diplomacy and repeatedly called Kim Jong-un names. Um, Biden it was a choice that was based on U.S. domestic politics, but it also shows that Biden didn't mind sacrificing the prospect of a smooth start uh, on diplomacy. And um, one point uh, to end, uh, finally, in which the Biden administration seems different from both the Obama and the Trump administration, is uh, some increasing public recognition that North Korea is unlikely to fully denuclearize. It's the conclusion that the U.S. intelligence community had highlighted for years. Um, denuclearization remains the top U.S. goal in theory, but Blinken in particular has signaled increasing openness to a more modest priority for now, uh, which would be arms control. And uh, I mean, arms control will still be difficult to achieve uh, given the continuing focus on pressure and adversarial uh, rhetoric or understanding of diplomacy. Uh, but it's, it's nevertheless a remarkable evolution uh, compared to the, the maximalism of Bolton's Libya model or uh, Pompeo's insistence on, um, on final fully verifiable denuclearization. So the, there is room to, to believe that uh, at least there would be subjects to talk about um, in my view. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, both Kuyan and Ang Lee laid down that uh, good uh, framework for today's discussion on the first topic. Uh, as Ang Lee just mentioned that the nominee for the Secretary of the State, uh, Mr. Blinken, uh, wrote a piece on the New York Times before the Singapore summit that the kind of model that U.S. should follow is their deal, deal with the Iran, uh, which he emphasized that the arms control type of uh, negotiation is uh, realistic and possible with, with the North Korea. So uh, my next question is to Clint and Song Chol. Uh, while the international community is pursuing the denuclearization of North Korea, taking a meaningful step toward the denuclearization seems to be uh, remote at this point. So given the current U.S.-North Korea impasse, what should be the first agenda ROK and the U.S. Uh, should consider? Uh, Clint, would you go first? Well, first thing, I just want to thank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and, and Kangwon National University and the Sejong Institute for putting on this, this timely event and inviting me to share the, the virtual stage, so to speak. I think the question itself sort of contains the seeds of an answer. Um, with talks at an impasse, I think the Allies should focus, first of all, on what they can control the most, which is to say reestablishing the alliance. Um, without reestablishing the alliance and alliance cohesion, I find it very hard to believe that progress can be made uh, with North Korea. Furthermore, as much as President Trump's worldview and his leadership style exacerbated differences between the Allies, uh, there are several areas where they show increasing divergence. Uh, this includes, of course, cost sharing, on their respective approaches toward North Korea, on the transfer of wartime operational control, and on how they each situate the alliance within the wider regional setting amidst worsening U.S.-China relations. 
of course I can't explore all of these topics, but I might, I might touch on a couple of them. I think the very first agenda item that should be settled is the cost sharing SMA talks. Uh, you know, Washington accepting Seoul's 13% increase or somewhere there around and signing a four to five year deal uh, as is consistent with past practice. I think this is relatively low hanging fruit and I think it, it can and it probably will get done rather quickly based on the signals that the Biden administration has sent. Uh, but I think the allies need to create a new alliance consultative framework or even frameworks to examine some of the other issues that I mentioned. Um, I think we need more than just a return to traditional alliance management. I think existing or legacy consultative structures can oftentimes inhibit rather than foster progress. And alliance transformation uh, requires new thinking. Uh, first, I think the allies need to align uh, as best as they can their respective approaches toward Pyongyang. Now, obviously, the Moon administration's remaining timeline does not perfectly align uh, with the Biden administration's, but this is this is unavoidable. Um, on the U.S. side, I would like to see uh, Washington embrace Seoul taking more of a lead on inter-Korean projects as a necessary precondition for denuclearization talks, rather than be perceived to be holding Seoul back as it was under the Trump administration. I think this is imperative because uh, it, it, Pyongyang has little incentive, I think, to, to sort of take Seoul's overture seriously otherwise. Um, and I also believe this requires, as some of the speakers have already alluded to, the Biden administration setting aside a failed maximalist approach toward denuclearization and instead try to strike a smaller deal which, which freezes capabilities where they currently are and incorporates arms control and confidence building measures to, to try to achieve momentum and build trust. Um, and again, maybe building on and reinvigorating the CMA structure, which, which is already in place. Um, you know, what's the alternative to this? North Korea continues to develop its capabilities and the differences between the allies remain unaddressed, um, which provides Pyongyang space and opportunity to exploit those differences, but also it continues this sort of slow moving, if informal no normalization of, of North Korea's nuclear status. Um, you know, I just want to quickly touch on another issue I mentioned, which is the issue of um, uh, the transfer of wartime operational control. Um, I, I'm really rather concerned about the degree to which this is misunderstood in both Washington and Seoul, and also the clashing views about the, the current process and, and what the outcome uh, will or should look like. Um, I, I don't have time to get into the details, but I think this really does require more regular and expanded consultation and public diplomacy. Um, and including uh, developing more regular and institutionalized interparliamentary cooperation and consultation between National Assembly members and Congress people. I really think from my observations and research, lawmakers on both sides don't properly understand the issue and how easily it could become a real flashpoint um, in the alliance. Um, I, of course, I don't have time to get into how the allies might situate the alliance amidst US-China uh, relations. I'll, I'll hopefully turn back to that later. Uh, but my bottom line is, is that there really needs to be a deliberate and concerted effort to reset the alliance. Um, it, it may not be a sufficient condition for progress toward denuclearization, but it's, it's undoubtedly a necessary one. Thank you, Clint. Uh, Song Chol, please. Yes, uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to this panel. I'm very happy to uh, share my ideas and hear your ideas. I, I agree with uh, Clint. Uh, the strong alliance is very important. So at this time, you should uh, put more efforts for the revive our the alliance between ROK and US. Uh, the the first agenda ROK and US to consider, I think uh, the two things are very important. The first one is a roadmap, the roadmap for the nuclear free North Korea. Uh, the last four years, I think there are some difference and some similarity the, between US and South Korea, uh, how to uh, deal with the North Korea how to achieve uh, the nuclear free North Korea. But at, the, at this time, I think we have to uh, have a long-term perspective. So we should make uh, the roadmap. So uh, we can uh, talk about the short-term goal and also mid-term goal and the final goal. So we uh, know that a one time the summit cannot solve the, this issue. So we should be more patient. So, and then we should talk about how to uh, deal with uh, this issue uh, with the open mind. So at the we think uh, how we uh, achieve uh, this uh, the object, the nuclear free North Korea. So we should be uh, talk more and then uh, make uh, the the long term the perspective and then 
the roadmap. Uh, second thing is the economic sanction. So um, the South Korea and US, we, we uh, share our opinion. The, the economic sanctions are very important, but we need to think about the China and Russia. So how we uh, make economic sanction uh, the continue. So how we uh, go with uh, China and Russia on this issue. So without doing this, go, uh, this job, I think uh, maybe China and Russia uh, will not go with uh, the, this issue. So how we maintain economic sanction, how we modify economic sanction. I think at this time, this is very important. There are many news about still some trade between China and North Korea and North Korea can some benefit from the trading with China. So uh, we need to reassess the impact of the economic sanction and then how we maintain our economic sanction against North Korea. Uh, thank you. So, so far, what we've discussed is about how to uh, resume the negotiations uh, with the North Korea and the United States and the international community. So, uh, as Ani and Clint mentioned, that the kind of maximalist approach taken by the Trump administration is kind of related to the roadmap of the denuclearization process of North Korea. So, the question is whether it's like really possible. So, the, my next question is Is like front loading a still a feasible alternative, or what should be the first deal that we can? realistically expect uh, between North Korea and the international community. Uh, can I go first with uh, Hanbir for this question? Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you for having me today. Um, uh, since 2018, the Korean Peninsula has spent three years of changes and expectations. However, as the North Korean nuclear weapons has been advanced during this period, I mean for three years, um, I think the front loading is valid and effective way for less reliable opponents to continue the dialogue. There have been several North Korea nuclear crises for over 30 years, and each one seems to be resolved through meaningful consensus, but the vicious cycle has continued, and uh, all cases collapsed in the early stages of implementing the Agree, agreed items without significant progress. Uh, also, the leader of the United States and North Korea who met in Singapore in 2018 failed to fulfill the agreement properly and hurt each other and will not be able to meet again. Uh, to turn distrust into confidence, uh, I think there's a faster, more fundamental and lower cost of front-loading type is essential. Front loading is not a one sided way to offer everything to North Korea. Uh, the longer it is delayed, the more distrust will be, it will build, and the higher the cost on either side. Um, in fact, the time factor is critical in the process of denuclearization of North Korea. The cost of tomorrow is always greater than today. The more the denuclearization process is delayed, the more favorable the situation will be for North Korea. Uh, in order to prevent North Korea from delaying the implementing of the agreements, it is also necessary to put a time limit to North Korea and to delay the benefits. On the other hand, many experts are considering, considering the snapback clause, but uh, we should know that there could be time gaps in the US policy making process. I think the North Korea strategy goal seems to have changed more aggressively over the past three years. To get out of this situation, uh, we must get out of this talks for dialogue trap. The conversation has been already delayed, so we should better prepare for it. A roadmap, yeah, as mentioned, it must be prepared through cooperation between South and South Korea and the U.S. Um, it is true that the denuclearization of North Korea is difficult to achieve over time. Um, but since the window of the opportunity has opened, so it is too early to conclude or give up. So we have to overcoming these negative conclusions um, 
yeah, it may not be easy for North Korea to accept the prompt loading method. However, North Korea came to the negotiating table in 2018 to gain strategic advantage with recognizing itself in a disadvantage. So uh, it is necessary not to meet the minimum level demanded by North Korea, but to increase pressure to make North Korea feel more disadvantageous. Um, and also, I would like to ask, ask to the United States presenters here, uh, what is the priority of Biden's administration over North Korean nuclear program? A second one is, the, since North Korea is demanding a withdrawal of a hostile policy, what can the US government suggest to North Korea? And when will uh, Biden send a signal of dialogue to North Korea? Yeah, I will stop here. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, Hanbil. Uh, Jessica, please. Yes. Hi, Dr. Wu. Um, great to see you again. And uh, Kuyan, thank you for organizing this. Um, and it's great to see Sarah as well and all my American colleagues who I know well. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, just going back to what Dr. Son said, um, you know, I, I think everyone in Washington who's watching North Korea, um, you know, policy uh, decisions uh, and issues uh, are very curious about Biden's personnel because, as he said, um, you know, that that is going to be a, a very clear signal uh, of, you know, President Biden's, um, you know, willingness to go big uh, and be bold uh, and transformative uh, or just sort of, you know, manage the problem um, in, in a very low profile way. Um, you know, I will say that um, I, I was, first of all, really heartened that uh, Guyon uh, arranged this uh, conference because uh, this webinar uh, conversation because, you know, I, I think the theme of this event is, is very appropriate. Um, you know, I think we're all experiencing uh, some level of fatigue uh, because sort of the same five people uh, are quoted every, every you know, news article uh, related to North Korea, the same three think tanks, and the, 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 the thinking uh, around North Korea has become quite uh, stagnant, uh, which is very dangerous because as everyone said, the problem is just getting bigger and bigger. Um, and so this is a very, a uh, bad uh, ish, uh, place to be uh, from American perspective. Um, you know, but I will say, you know, when you're seeing people like Victor Cha and Kirk Campbell basically saying, hey, the past strategies haven't worked. Uh, it's time for a bold approach, maybe even like Trump, you know, as, uh, you know, Dr. Campbell recently uh, said, I mean, that's, it, it, you know, refreshing uh, because, you know, they are obviously, um, you know, uh, Quite influential uh, in this space, and and you know bring a lot of credibility to the argument uh, by uh, taking such a stand. And so I think that's um, important. Uh, but I, I would say, you know, Washington right now, I think it is searching for a way to um, kind of. I, if I were in the Biden administration, I would be looking for a way to basically take the best of what the Trump administration has done and then really continue on in the diplomatic path um, as quickly as possible, uh, which is the question at hand here, how quickly, what does front loading look like uh, and so forth. Um, and I would, you know, I would say that in the first hundred days, he needs to send a very clear signal uh, that, you know, this sort of um, game that we've been playing where we pretend North Korea doesn't, you know, have nuclear weapons or would be willing to give them all up, <laughs> um, you know, is somehow going to, you know, manifest itself in, in something that um, is other than um, complete impasse. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I've been writing about is, you know, what, what are those clear signals? Um, it could be an end of war declaration, which I've uh, commented extensively on, um, or, you know, other kind of clear signal, um, you know, even just uh, on the end of war declaration, which I've, you know, um, publicly uh, spoken in favor of, um, he's going to run into some uh, criticism, you know, he's, he's going to run into a huge amount of, you know, political partisan, um, you know, um, attack that say, well, how could you, you know, do this with a country like North Korea? Um, and so part of what, you know, I think needs to happen from the outside of government is, you know, creating that political space so that he can be bold. Uh, Trump was such an unconventional leader. He really, I, I guess, didn't care all that much what Democrats would say uh, and do about this issue. So he sort of kind of did his own thing, um, which in hindsight kind of helped in some ways, but obviously, you know, it didn't result in, in the permanent change that we want to see on the peninsula. So. Um, you know, I think, so, you know, bottom line, Biden absolutely should go, um, you know, it should, should make a very clear signal early on in the administration rather than waiting for North Korean uh, provocation. Um, uh, so, 
you know, but again, it's much more complex than just saying, you know, hey, we think the Korean War has ended uh, and we want to reach a different type of relationship a la Singapore Declaration. I mean, I, I think that's great, but it's also what is the anticipated reaction uh, of Congress? What is Congress going to do if Biden does that? Um, they are legislating every year uh, the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, which gives Pentagon various authorities, and they could easily put in language some, that, some you know, within that kind of must-pass bill uh, or some kind of budget bill, um, you know, that creates roadblocks for Biden. Um, so these are all things that are very easy to anticipate um, as a strategist. Um, and so the question becomes, how do you set in motion certain things to protect against and, and create those uh, kind of, you know, guardrails against uh, obstruction uh, that could come uh, if Biden were to say declare the war over and pursue a peace treaty. Um, so I think, you know, bottom line is we need more than just five people in Washington saying this. Um, and oftentimes, as you saw in the race for the House Foreign Affairs Committee chairmanship, um, it, it's young progressive voices like Joaquin Castro who are bold, um, who are kind of questioning everything <laughs> about why Washington does what it does and calling out BS. You know, um, and I was very uh, inspired by his candidacy. Of course, he lost the chairmanship. Uh, but the fact that you had someone like that, um, that was willing to take foreign policy head on, you know, and sort of the dysfunction of Washington head on uh, and call out, you know, all the ways in which our policies are broken and need to be changed, uh, I think was really encouraging. Uh, but uh, we need people like that at all levels, uh, including outside of government. And so um, my hope is that we can uh, kind of in encourage that uh, when we see it um, and also remind people who are going to be in positions of power that actually there is a, a you know that things are changing it's not going to be back to the obama years there are enough people asking the right questions and enough people who are well connected to know uh that something is about to happen versus just kind of showmanship uh that i think we can actually um you know move the needle uh if, if there were a concerted effort so i'll stop there uh, thanks, Jessica. Uh, before moving on to uh, my like last prepared questions, I want to uh, tell the audiences of this event that if you have like any questions, please use the like chatting window uh, for sending me the questions to the panelists. Then I will pick the questions and ask uh, to them on your behalf. So my next question is, how do you expect the role of China in this process? And ultimately, what could be the factor that facilitate the peace initiative of uh, ROK? Uh, can we go uh, first uh, with uh, Sarah, please? Thank you. And my thanks to Kangwon National University and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for inviting me today to this evening's discussion or this morning's discussion. Um, let me say first that my expectation is that China will continue to play the spoiler role. Beijing obviously has interests which are fundamentally divergent from those of Washington and Seoul when it comes to the DPRK, and that's not going to change anytime soon. Taking a step back for a moment and spanning out to the wider issue of US-China relations, I suspect here that Beijing is going to adopt a wait and see approach, much like everyone else, to see how the Biden administration is going to play things. When it comes to North Korea, they're going to do everything they can to continue to remind all parties, and I include Pyongyang in that category, that you need us, or rather, we need to have a seat at the table when it comes to peninsula affairs. And the message will be, don't expect to make progress or cut a deal without us. And I said this applies both to Washington and Pyongyang. Uh, Beijing, in short, is going to use all of its levers of influence and pressure on Pyongyang to not get ahead of where Be uh, Beijing wants to go. And so personally, I'm very skeptical that we're going to see uh, any progress on the North Korean diplomatic front anytime soon. Uh, the conventional wisdom, and I used to belong in this category, was that as in past practice, uh, the North Koreans would do something in uh, early on uh, to remind the incoming US administration, as they have done in the past, that 
hello, we're still here, you need to deal with us. Uh, but I'm starting to move away from that position a little bit. I think it's still very possible the North Koreans will do something pro provocative early on, like a test like we've seen in the past. It's probably the most likely outcome. But it's also possible that the pandemic has them and the United States certainly as well, so preoccupied at the moment that Pyongyang simply doesn't have time for its usual provocations right now. And on the US side, the Biden team will also have its hands full. And I think this is uh, something that is underappreciated around the world right now, how busy uh, the Biden administration is going to be, primarily with domestic issues. Uh, we have uh, uh, 2,800 Americans who died yesterday and the same number today. So COVID and the economy are gonna take the Biden administration's full attention. But there are also a long list of international issues. Um, so uh, to go back to Dr. Sun's question before about priorities, I would, put, I would put North Korea in the top three of the Biden administration's international priorities, but I'm not sure I would put it at number one. Uh, it depends on uh, what happens in the next 45 or so days, and of course, uh, whether the North Koreans um, do something provocative. Let me just uh, quickly add two things. Um, one on um, the point of uh, the Henri made about asking China to put pressure on North Korea. I mean, this has been uh, a, a policy or, or, or a tactic employed by previous U.S. administrations. I think given uh, where things are likely to go in the U.S.-China relationship, um, that's not going to work. Uh, it hasn't arguably worked in the past, but I'm also surprised, uh, um, I'll be surprised to see if that's the way they go. Um, I think they will go more broader and multilateral, but but I'll have more to say that uh, on that later on. The other point I want to say uh, just quickly is to echo uh, what Clint said earlier uh, in terms of the bilateral relationship uh, between Seoul and Washington and, and really um, to um, agree with his warning that there is potential for the OPCON discussion, which is very poorly understood on this side of things, um, to get out of hand very quickly. I mean, all, all it'll take, frankly, is one Fox News story, uh, and you can see uh, the uh, alliance relationship really um, deteriorating Congress, um, um, put a halt to things. So uh, I, I, I think that the OPCON discussion and the education component, not just in in, in Congress, but the uh, with the wider American public needs to be up front when we talk about the US ROK alliance relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I, I'll go back to Angni uh, for like th Sarah's comment on like Chinese role uh, after uh, Sang Chul's comment on this question. Sang Chul, please. Yes, uh, let me uh, talk about China. Uh, uh, at this time, I'm not positive on the role of China, uh, but I, the, I believe that China is very important, but at this time we cannot expect the positive role of China. The main reason is uh, the increasing tension between the U.S. and China. So uh, as you know, there are so many issues between U.S. and China. So in the next U.S. administration, I think there are more some tension and also some chasm between two blocks. Um, so the reality we should upset is that we need China and Russia uh, in uh, solving the nuclear free uh, North Korea, the North Korean problem. Uh, but uh, it, it is uh, easy to see the, some real cooperation between US and China and South Korea and Russia on this issue. So I think it's a big, uh, big problem, uh, but we need to know uh, this situation. So, uh, on the, the issue of the North Korean problem, uh, U.S. and South Korea uh, should go with uh, the China and Russia. So uh, economic sanction and human rights and so on many issues, uh, we should come together. So how we make us uh, international coordination, uh, international coalition for, for the solving the North Korean problem. I think it's, it's uh, very important. So, and second is, uh, the U.S. and South Korea, South Korea and U.S. Uh, should be patient. So uh, last four years, a big lesson is uh, just one-time summit. The one-time negotiation cannot solve this issue. So we should be very uh, patient. And also 
uh, we need to think about uh, we should get some international support and also domestic support from the US public and South Korean public. I think uh, the, the international support and domestic support based op approach to uh, North Korea, I think is a, a, a key for the, the solving those grand problem in the long term perspective. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ani, uh, could you uh, com make a comment on like Sarah's point that how we can lead China into playing a like positive role uh, in the denuclearization process of North Korea? Well, I mean, I think I agree with the general sentiment that we've heard that uh, it's going to be difficult um, given the rising US-China tensions. And, and these are <clears throat> These are forces that go much beyond uh, the, the Korean Peninsula. There is a clear bipartisan trend right now in the U.S. to uh, treat China primarily as a competitor. And uh, what, while there may be divergences in how to approach it, whether it's more disengagement, decoupling, or whether it's more to, uh, towards um, a sort of containment, um, that will, will, will affect what is possible with China as well. Uh, of course, if, if there is more of an approach towards containment of China, China will feel threatened and will see North Korea as uh, a more valuable asset uh, in a possible confrontation uh, with the United States. If there is a move more towards uh, some sort of deco uh, decoupling or disengagement, um, there will be a recalculation for every actor in, uh, in the region. Uh, and that may well lead China and North Korea to have uh, more complicated relations. Uh, uh, relations. It's, it's a sort of dynamic that one might have seen uh, notably in the context of Vietnam and China, where uh, originally they were sort of in the, in the same camp, but once normalization with the United States happened, what took, um, what took more importance for Vietnam, or what seemed like the potential major uh, national security threat for Vietnam became China. And uh, in, in that sense, there, there is a possible change of dynamic, but not, I think, in a context where uh, there, there is a confrontation or a form of containment of China. Thank you. Uh, there's a one question from our viewers, uh, Jeffrey Robertson, that many commentators these days talk about new approach toward North Korea without really specifying what that new approach really is. So what is uh, floating around in DC? Can our panelists from the US talk about like what is, uh, what idea is like floating around in DC and what, what do you think about it? Uh, can you go first with uh, like Clint? I, I, I sort of share that same question as I use that language and then grapple with what its meaning is. Um, but I think I, I might refer back to some of the comments that Jessica made. Um, and when you see more establishment figures uh, such as such as Victor Cha and, and people who have generally taken a more a more hawkish approach or or hawkish hawkish engagement as he once phrased it towards North Korea, saying that the old ways, the different variations have not worked, th th that is saying something. Um, it definitely lends credence to the fact that um, the old the old ways of doing it uh, are not um, are, are not going to get us anywhere. I think then what does a new approach look like? I, I think, I, I wouldn't say there's a growing consensus around this idea, but I, there, there are more voices in, in DC uh, calling for a more arms control approach. Um, and I might invoke a, a phrase that my, that my colleague Jenny Town at 30 North uses, which I, I wholeheartedly agree with, which is you know, stopping a train from, from leaving the station is much different than, than stopping it once it has left, once it's already in, in, in full speed ahead. And so the North Korean nuclear program, um, you know, is, is not uh, like the Iranian one, um, which, which, you know, had not essentially, they had not broken out. The North Koreans, they have, but, you know, by all you know, intents and purposes, they're a de facto nuclear power, and obviously have demonstrated, at least theoretically, the ability to, to reach the mainland US. So this is a threat that, um, you know, approaching it from the standpoint of, of, of sort of denuclearization, maximalist denuclearization as the, as the upfront goal, um, I think is, um, is not only unrealistic uh, in the short term, but also counterproductive because it's a non-starter with Pyongyang. Um, so again, I don't think it's a consensus view in DC towards an arms control approach or accepting a smaller deal, 
but it's a, it's an idea that doesn't get laughed out of the room the way it once uh, might have in the not too distant past. So, and I'm, I know I'm going on long now, but I think one other angle, and again, to piggyback on Jessica's remarks is, is something along the lines of, of a declaration ending the Korean War. Um, I, I, one problematic development that I've seen over the last few years is the way that diplomacy and defense or diplomacy and deterrence have been sort of disaggregated from one another as though, uh, as though, you know, supporting, enhancing deterrence is somehow, um, you know, mutually exclusive from diplomacy. And I don't think it is. I think diplomacy and peace and deterrence are two sides of the same coin. Um, so the other, the other argument is that just because you push for diplomacy and towards, uh, you know, a more peaceful orientation doesn't mean you disarm. Um, and I think HRES 152, uh, which only has one Republican supporter and about 52 Democratic supporters, I think contains the language that, that tries to thread that needle. Of, of, of trying to reorient the relationship before we're even asking for demands. And I might just add that, you know, former General Vincent K. Brooks uh, says this quite frequently. Um, and, and this is somebody who knows full well the threat that North Korea poses and the need to have a, a strong deterrent structure. Um, that was a bit of a wide in response, but I hope it provided some insight. Let me add more details on the same question that we discussed like Tony Brinken's article in 2018 on New York Times, and many in both Washington and Seoul argue that uh, this approach might uh, work with North Korea because uh, Obama administration's negotiation with Iran worked, uh, even though Trump administration reversed it. So one of the points that, that was discussed in South Korea is might be a small deal uh, rather than maximalist approach would work with the North Korea. But uh, Tony Blinken pointed out in his article that uh, one of the achievements that his administration made was indefinite intrusive monitoring was uh, written in the negotiations. So Will it be possible that North Korea would accept this kind of uh, inspection and verification for uh, what compensation packages? Uh, can we go with uh, Jessica on this question? Sorry, so can, can you just clarify the question? You're saying, uh, would North Korea essentially accept a smaller deal that, accepts, um, that includes um, you know, verification and inspection? Is that, okay, got it. Yeah, uh, which is essentially what an arms control agreement would set to do. Um, so yes, um, so that's a great question. Um, I think there can be, I, I think a case can be made that North Korea would be willing to, you know, uh, accept such level of, you know, intrusive IAEA level, you know, uh, inspections uh, and gradual dismantlement um, uh, and verification of all the uh, nuclear weapons facilities, uh, production facilities and so forth. Uh, but it's gonna ha it's gonna happen in a very gradual way, um, it, because you know as we know it, that's sort of their survival <laughs> mechanism. They're not gonna just give it up. I mean that that, that makes no sense. That that's completely um, you know I think delusional uh, to to think that way. And so the question becomes, well, what are the positive security you know assurances that they would need uh, in order to essentially um, you know solely reveal and give up uh, their you know core survival. Um, guarantee. And so, you know, part of, you know, solving that puzzle is in, you know, moving past the Korean War framework um, and thinking more about, okay, well, what, what are the security, um, you know, geostrategic uh, conditions on the Korean Peninsula that uh, affect North Koreans and as much as South Koreans? <laughs> you know, what are transnational threats that, you know, knows no border? Um, are there, you know, ways in which we can elicit kind of cooperation along those lines um, that, presumably is, um, you know, a little bit easier than, you know, yeah, let's sit down and talk about nothing, you know, nothing but arms control. Um, so I guess the, the short answer to your question would be, I think that there is a way. Um, and I think that um, keeping the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula as a longer term goal makes total sense. Uh, and, and it's probably very smart, uh, because we know that, you know, uh, if we declare up front, well, you know, United States will recognize North Korea as a, you know, nuclear, um, uh, nuclear state. It's sort of a done deal. Um, these are all the weapons that we think they have. You know, that's going to create a whole set of other uh, problems vis-a-vis uh, -vis Seoul and Tokyo. Um, and so I do uh, think that keeping the denuclearization goal as a long-term objective makes a whole lot of sense. 
Uh, but again, there, there's a lot that can be done to reduce and mitigate the, the risk of a nuclear conflict with North Korea and arms control agreement a la JCPOA would be one way to do it. Although obviously JCPOA was with a country that didn't have nuclear weapons, North Korea is much more advanced than that. So it's uh, kind of like comparing apples and oranges. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it, it, it's getting more interesting, but we have to move on to our second topic of the discussion today because of the like time limits. So the for the second uh, topic, uh, I would like to ask, uh, like ROK-US alliance has lasted more than half century and deepened their cooperation in multiple domains. Given the changing security environment in Indo-Pacific, what could be the major source of uh, differences between the allies? Uh, can you go first with uh, Ang Lee, please? So, I mean, what's clear is that the, the US ROK alliance remains popular in both countries. Um, but there are increasing divergences on how to approach China and North Korea. Um, there was a Sh Chicago Council poll last year that showed that a majority of, of South Koreans, 55 percent, thought uh, that Seoul and Washington were working in, in different directions um, on regional security. Now, uh, as, as I was mentioning before, there is this bipartisan trend in the United States to treat China primarily as a competitor. This, uh, this at times puts South Korea uh, in a difficult position. I think that's clear uh, to, to everybody, uh, to the extent that uh, the United States is its main military ally and China's main trade partner. And that was clear in the, 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 the sort of conundrums this can lead to uh, was clear in, in the role over the, the FAD missile defense system, where uh, from, from from a U.S. perspective, this was necessary to uh, ensure that the U.S. could uh, uphold its uh, alliance obligations to South Korea. Um, and where from a Chinese perspective, there was a, a suspicion that this could be used also uh, against China. And South Korea uh, ultimately was a bit trapped uh, insofar as it could not, it was difficult for it to show that it was clearly an independent uh, move just directed. Uh, against North Korea. And, and there is a risk with the rising US-China tensions that this sort of scenario comes up uh, again and again. Um, in how, how to address that is, uh, it, there, there is no quick fix to it, but at least leaving South Korea, the, the space to appear as an in, independent actor vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, vis -vis China, not forcing it to choose between uh, the United States and China. Uh, in many ways would be uh, would be the start of uh, a way to approach this uh, on on north korea there is uh, there is a divergence on uh, or at least one we have seen under the trump administration there is a divergence on whether to pri prioritize pressure or confidence building in in approaching north korea the the tensions here i think were were quite clear at the end of 2018 when uh, the trump administration invoked the alliance and the need to advance in lockstep to ask South Korea to um, slow down on uh, inter-Korean reconciliation projects, uh, notably uh, what drew the attention is the inter-Korean military agreement. The ask was that South Korea slow down until there is progress on denuclearization. There is, of course, uh, much to be said about, for alliance coordination, but the problem was that Trump's approach did not work. Uh, and this, of course, leaves uh, South Korea with uh, wondering, well, what could have been possible if um, the approach of uh, leading with confidence building uh, could have pre created a platform for uh, a more productive discussion and perhaps more um, uh, uh, more progress also on the denuclearization side. Uh, so overall, uh, I, I think from, from, from my personal perspective, Part of the problem in the US ROK alliance right now is that it's very rigid uh, and there is a rigid expectation that South Korea would follow um, how the United States would like to approach China, how the United States would like to approach North Korea. To a certain extent, it's uh, understandable uh, insofar as the United States wants to ensure its alliance obligations. Uh, and to another extent, it also leaves South Korea very little wiggle room, um, and it, 
makes it more difficult to avoid uh, collateral damage uh, of the US-China uh, tensions, of US-North Korea tensions. And if it doesn't happen voluntarily, in my view, it will happen. Uh, South Korea will start investing more and more in indep independent defense capabilities, a trend that's already started with Defense Reform 2.0. And uh, what, what then happens with the alliance is anyone's guess. But, I, I believe both countries have uh, have an interest in in, in upholding it, this this long time relationship, but it, it will require a bit of rethinking about how it works. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ang Lee. Uh, Kuyan, please. Uh, yes, I mostly agree with Ang Lee, uh, but well, yeah, I think there are three differences between two allies, uh, especially between uh, Biden and uh, the Moon administration. Moon administration. Uh, first one is, as many participants have mentioned, that a uh, roadmap for the in North Korea would be kind of discussed, very tightly discussed, and about the terms and uh, terms of negotiations and process of negotiations and also the end state of uh, this negotiation because it will ultimately uh, affect the military posture in the region and also unification policy of the South Korea in, in particular. So. I think uh, the difference uh, would uh, resonate uh, mainly from this North Korea policy, and I think this would be the first uh, priority between two allies to discuss uh, in the coming years. And the second difference would be, as Ang Lee mentioned, is the perception of a U.S.-China competition. And especially during the Trump administration, uh, it was all about competitions and decouplings, uh, which make it uh, much harder uh, positions to negotiate with China and coordinate their policy with the United States. And all the regional powers, uh, like middle powers, like South Korea and Australia and others, uh, we had to, uh, we had no option for hedging uh, against this risk uh, between two great powers competition. So it makes us to uh, very hard to coordinate foreign policy in China with the United States and North Korea and another security initiative led by United States as well, like in the Pacific strategies and others. And the third one would be the different uh, expectations about trilateral cooperations. And, I believe Biden would uh, put uh, more emphasis on this trilateral than uh, Trump administrations, and it will it will be the part of security architecture in the in the Pacific. But we have different expectations about trilateral and and different understanding about the inclusion of Japan in uh, security cooperation because of all the perennial antagonism and historical issues uh, with Japan. So. Uh, it might be hard to, uh, especially for, United, uh, for South Korea and Japan, to elevate to countries' level of cooperation, uh, which is now limited to like a working level cooperation on many issues, but it's, it would be very hard for us to uh, elevate that cooperation to a kind of official level, which make it uh, have different uh, perception and different expectation for um, uh, this trilateral, which uh, would be kind of another constraint for the United States to uh, build a kind of secure architecture in the Pacific. I think that would be the kind of three uh, differences and uh, kind of uh, spots we have to work on. Uh, thank you, Guyan. Uh, so we've discussed the differences now. Uh, what would be the like, potential area of cooperation in terms of traditional security issues? Uh, Hanbyeol, uh, would you go first? As discussed earlier, I, I still believe that the most important area for the Iraq US alliance to work together is the deterrence of North Korea's nuclear weapons. Since North Korea has become capable of attacking the US mainland, the denuclearization of North Korea is a task that cannot be delayed. And it is another name for the peace process that the two Koreas are trying to realize. So how to control North Korea, which has nuclear weapons, is a matter for the Rock us alliance to continue to consider until the North Korea completely give up, gives up its nuclear weapon program. This is because the military posture is not a plan B, but a basic condition for negotiation. And as the, Dr. U, the moderator asked me, a potential area, we could expand the scope. The Korea and the US have already presented an alliance vision as summit in 2003, 2005, and 2009 for promoting the common value of democracy, market economy, freedom of and human rights in Asia and the rest of the world. That means 
far beyond the threat response on Korean Peninsula. Um, and in 2013 and 2015, both presidents said it would expand cooperation, including cyber, space, climate change, and global health. In, in many ways, Rock-US Alliance has many areas to cooperate, counterterrorism, uh, nuclear non-proliferation, non outer space and cyber domain, um, the pandemic and biological threats, peacekeeping, um, post-stabilization and reconstruction. So I want to emphasize two things. First, cooperation in the new strategic space area, the existing cooperation on the ground, air and sea is still important. However, South Korea is trying to expand its capabilities and roles in space and cyberspace. And the United States needs a reliable ally to maintain leadership in these new areas. The ROC-US alliance will be able to use current cooperative mechanisms such as SCM, MCM, EDS, CG, and KEY, so which are well established between Korea and United States. With these, the alliance can share cost and roles and enhance cross-domain deterrence across these five strategic areas. The second one is the leading role of Korea at the regional level. The South Korea is no longer concerned about the peripheral threat confined to the Korean Peninsula, as Korea's political, diplomatic, and economic capabilities has grown. Its interest area has expanded it wants to play a leading role in East Asia beyond the Korean Peninsula. And for the U.S., which more focus on Asia, um, they need, the U.S. needs the mediation of Asian countries essential. I mean, Korea's role for the U.S. is emphasized rather than any other Asian countries. So as the situation on the Korean Peninsula has changed rapidly since 2018, yeah, in Korea, some people blame the U.S. and many experts in the U.S. complain of Korean fatigue. For the U.S., however, the Rock us alliance is not a transactional instrument, but a strategic asset. And for Korea, the alliance has been the centerpiece of Korean security for the past 70 years. Even if the situation changes in the future, the importance of the Rock us alliance will not, be, will not change easily. So, Latvia's alliance should pursue the concept of the, the comprehensive, dynamic, and reciprocal alliance. Yeah, I'll stop here, Chair. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, Sarah, please. Thank you. So as I said in my earlier comments, I think it's pretty obvious at this point that China is going to be the focus of the new Biden administration's Asia policy. And that's going, and the administration is going to see every other Asia issue, including North Korea, in terms of China. And here I think there's going to be continuity from the Trump years in the sense that it's going to be a much more competitive strategy, much more so than where things left off in the Obama years. It'd be a mistake to assume that we're going back to the Obama years on this issue area. Where it's obviously going to depart from the Trump administration is that the Biden team won't have this go it alone attitude that we've seen with the Trump team. And we're already seeing lots of chatter about a so-called alliance of democracies linking America's Atlantic and Pacific partners. Kurt Campbell was out talking about it earlier today. And so my expectation is that Washington will be coming to Seoul, and not just Seoul, but will be coming to Seoul early in the new year with the message that we'd really like to see you develop better relations, not just with other of our partners in, in, in Asia, uh, but globally, uh, including NATO, uh, on a much ranger, a larger and range of issues than in the past. Um, there are early indications that uh, this view would also be welcomed on the part of the European allies in NATO, uh, who have uh, indicated through the NATO 2030 report that came out earlier this month, which is a precursor to the Alliance's strategic review, which will begin next year, um, indicating that one of the recommendations is for NATO to develop closer uh, partnerships with, among others, South Korea Japan, Australia, New Zealand. So I'm expecting that we'll see a lot of 
chatter in the new year continuing a lot of movement uh, on the part of uh, Washington encouraging its Atlantic and Pacific partners to um, start engaging in more frequent high-level diplomatic exchanges meetings even the possibility of more intelligence cooperation training exercises I think that's going to be the clear message uh, from Washington over the certainly the next 18 months uh, yes bilateral relationships matter but expect to hear a lot about the uh, the need to develop more multilateral relationships and I noticed in the in the chat box there was a comment about uh, Korea's new southern policy I think that will be encouraged by the Biden administration and they'll be saying more of this please and also to echo Kuyon's point about trilateralism right not just trilateralism multilateralism um, the Biden administration is going to have its hands full and it's going to want its allies to work together on a, a, a range of issues that perhaps we haven't seen in the past. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Let's move on to the non-traditional security area. So what could be the non-traditional security challenges for two allies to cope with? Uh, Mihua, can you go first, please, on this question? Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure to be part of uh, this uh, expert conversation. And uh, when I uh, was given with this question, I was like wondering how to, I need to clarify what the tradi non-traditional security challenges are, right? This concept is very uh, com complex and overarching, and it's it's emerged from a new security approach, a uh, new approach in security policy circles to expand the international community's attention beyond state to include individual human beings as a reference point for security, like uh, in what's uh, was said in and Hans in 2009. And after listening to what uh, the panelists have been discussing in the former session of today's talk, uh, I, I think that what I'm going to address is uh, the anything but uh, direct external military threat to a state's uh, survival, physical survival, okay? So uh, um, it's uh, to make it easier, uh, uh, the, the specific issue areas like uh, international terrorism, transnational organized crimes, and environmental security, economic securities, and cybersecurity, and migration, energy security, and human rights, or um, all those health security, all those broad uh, uh, items will fall into this. Uh, this uh, vague overarching uh, uh, concept. So here today, I'm going to uh, focus on non-military threat to the well-being of individuals uh, for today's uh, talk. So uh, before moving on to, before mapping out uh, the the non, uh, non-traditional security challenges uh, that uh, the South Korea and America is facing, uh, I let me uh, assess, let me first assess the state of the world uh, that the Biden uh, will be inheriting from the Trump administration. So because in order to effect effectively tackle the non-traditional security threats, we need a global response and we need to understand uh, what 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 is the uh, uh, environment for uh, for such global cooperation? So, in a nutshell, international liberal wor world order that used to be the rules of the game for the international community for the past seventy five years has been damaged severely over the past four years, and President Trump played a significant significant role in it. So the U.S. has been pulling out from various international agreements and institutions while attacking their fundamental legitimacy and values, right? So it undermines the credibility of American commitment to the established rules of the game, not to mention the legitimacy and competence of existing international organizations. So made America an unreliable partner to cooperate with in the eyes of its longtime allies. So in the meantime, we uh, have witnessed the rise of authoritarianism across the globe. Non-democratic powers such as China and Russia seem to offer an attractive uh, alternative way of governing one society um, to less developed and developing countries as America was phasing out of uh, from the multilateral institutions, right? Um, and um, now they, now these countries do not really uh, do not have to care about uh, keeping up with good governance, with the less corruption, more respect for human rights, and etc. As long as they buy in Chinese or uh, 
other uh, powerful authoritarian countries, companies, or products and labors, right? So as President Trump himself committed, uh, committed a serious forms of human rights violations, such as uh, its brutal immigration policies to separate children from uh, their parents, America also has been losing moral high ground uh, in international affairs too. So with the absence of America, with, un with this absolute unwillingness of American engagement in multilateralism, the world is facing, have been facing unprecedented globalized threat from all fronts, right? So with this in background, and given that the Biden administration signals that the world, uh, signals the world that America will be back in place. So we'll, we'll be back. Right? as a leader of multilateralism for the rule-based liberal international order, I think the South Korea and America should cooperate, on, uh, cooperate to address uh, the following non-traditional security threats. The first of all, uh, global health security caused by the uh, COVID-19. And also, uh, it's overshadowed by the imminent COVID-19 uh, struggle uh, across the world, but the climate change is the imminent, uh, the, the most urgent uh, global, uh, threat to, existential threat to international community, and also cybersecurity and digital evolution and human rights violations. I'm going to explain, uh, I'm going to focus my uh, points on global health security and climate change uh, initiatives later uh, for my uh, for the second questions, but I will end up here. Uh, thank you, Miwa. Jessica, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, Miha, Miha did a great job, um, I think, outlining what I was going to say in terms of uh, the non-traditional threats in uh, climate change as well as um, public health. Um, my organization uh, actually has a playbook for the Biden administration. I can put on the chat function here uh, that summarizes, you know, uh, the need uh, for uh, transnational cooperation along these uh, planetary issues um, and that we can't afford to uh, ignore them, uh, particularly between U.S. and China as the two largest emitters. Um, uh, you know, and so I see a lot of, uh, you know, areas, uh, potential areas of uh, cooperation between U.S. and South Korea when it comes to both issues. Um, you know, I think, you know, just taking a step back, um, as Miwa also alluded to, um, you know, there's a lot going on in the United States um, in general, I think as all panelists have already said, um, you know, Sarah mentioned the, the death toll, um, you know, 3,000 Americans died today from COVID. Um, and so the, the concern I think from us um, is going to be around how do we rebuild our country uh, and how do we uh, get back on our feet? Um, and so, um, you know, one, uh, you know, possible window into how the Biden administration is thinking about that um, and dealing with these uh, non-military threats in a pandemic, um, you know, is a, a report that Jake Sullivan uh, helped write at the Carnegie Endowment, um, in which he lays out basically a foreign policy that would be good for the middle class. Uh, and he emphasizes that this is really, uh, you know, it's not just something cities and states should be worried about in terms of making sure that Americans have um, you know, uh, feel supported um, as the country, you know, changes um, in terms of adjustment programs, training programs, um, and things like that, uh, as well as, you know, investing uh, in its own infrastructure and, and sort of, the, you know, focusing more, much more heavily on uh, domestic politics as a, you know, a high uh, White House concern. Um, so he, you know, the report, for example, mentions how President Eisenhower had rolled out the national highway system at the height of the Cold War. Um, and so you, I think we're going to start, you know, see a lot more sort of, um, you know, very high level, uh, you know, interest in building American economy and American society uh, as a primary uh, kind of focus of the administration. But turning to foreign policy and, of course, bilateral relations, uh, which is the focal point of, of, of this discussion. And, um, you know, I, I think South Korea is, as the most advanced, you know, uh, country in terms of broadband access and other things have a lot to offer. Um, you know, it might be smaller than the United States, but, you know, South Korea has managed to uh, deal with these issues in ways that I think are very admirable um, and, and ways uh, that Americans should frankly learn from. And so how we kind of convey that and, and, and build those kinds of, um, you know, cooperation, I think, uh, will require um, you know, just a, a very thoughtful, deliberative uh, approach. Uh, but I, I think across the board, uh, South Korea has shown uh, time and again that it is uh, run by technocrats who, you know, appreciate science, who wants data and, and makes, you know, sound decisions that 
uh, advance, you know, the country, um, you know, in, in a fairly egalitarian way. And that's something that I think, uh, you know, Americans have to do a better job of. And so um, I, I guess uh, just to conclude um, there, I think, again, you know, in terms of our uh, focus at the Quincy Institute, you know, we are concerned about those non-military threats, um, you know, that Miwa described. Um, for reasons that, you know, I think all of us can appreciate uh, climate change and pandemic. I mean, these are things that are starting to have a real, um, you know, bottom line <laughs> uh, impact on the lives of people. Um, and so um, you're starting to see, I think, um, you know, through things like the Sunrise Movement and other kind of grassroots, uh, you know, uh, organizations that are putting a very high premium on um, tackling climate change. And you're seeing, um, and, and that was an, uh, an organization that I believe uh, had a major impact on Senator Markey's reelection um, over his Democratic primary opponent. Um, and so you're seeing some very savvy organizational kind of, you know, infrastructure that are emerging to tackle, uh, you know, issues like climate change that, uh, you know, I think will be um, interesting for uh, South Korean civil society to also learn from as well. So this is, you know, the the kind of the kinds of cooperation in in the non-military sphere. Um, I guess um, just to summarize, would you know, are by definition going to involve a whole of society effort. You know, it can't just be a couple of bureaucrats at Ministry of Foreign Affairs who take you know puts out a blueprint and then like nothing happens because nobody knows about it, nobody cares, nobody feels invested. I mean, same thing with the United States. So there's got to be a way to really, you know. Um, have a mental adjustment of some kind uh, toward, you know, tackling these global challenges in a way that uh, will be sustainable um, and has a, a broad buy-in and um, understanding. So I think there's a lot of work to be done in that uh, in this space for sure. Thank you. Uh, next question is related to the the issues that we just handled. So will two allies be on the same page in dealing with non-traditional security challenges? What is the specific area that two allies can cooperate better? Uh, Clint, would you go first? I think uh, Mihwan and Jessica really hit a lot of important points, some of which I wanted to, to hit as well. So I'll just say I agree uh, with, with things they said. Um, but to answer the first part of the question, I think, uh, yes, undoubtedly, the two allies will be much uh, more on the same page in dealing with non-traditional security challenges under a Biden administration. Um, you know, as Miwa laid out very well, non-traditional security challenges are by definition transnational in nature, and they don't respect traditional conceptions of sovereignty. The state is not the referent, it's society, the individual state, society relations, to be fair. But these are not conducive to unilateral solutions. So but by, by nature, they require uh, multilateral cooperation and in institutions. Um, so I think that they are best dealt with in that sort of fora. Um, again, the Biden administration does promise a return to U.S. leadership in these areas, uh, but they have a, a fantastic ally in Seoul um, that's been a firm proponent of the rules-based international order, and it's led the way on issues such as addressing infectious diseases, obviously the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, and has been an active participant in, in sort of overseas development uh, and international peacekeeping operations, um, and of course, depending on how the, the the uh, pandemic progresses, Seoul may still hold the UN Ministerial Conference on, on peacekeeping operations this spring. Um, so in regard to specific areas for alliance cooperation, um, they might try to recognize, for example, and build upon existing activities that they're both engaged in and maybe incorporate them in more precise ways. Uh, for example, this could mean identifying areas like overseas development, cooperation, or international peacekeeping operations where both countries are already on the ground, but where their missions or contributions may be uncoordinated, they might work to better coordinate those. Um, that said, I might, I might just shift gears a little bit because as I said, some of the speakers mentioned things I wanted to bring up uh, and turn to, again, a, a common theme of our discussion, which is US-China competition in a post-COVID world. And of course, this is in traditional military competition, uh, but also in areas like supply chain security and standard setting innovative R&D and defense modernization and, and how cutting edge technologies often dual use are employed and used. Uh, and this is a complex set of issues. And I think it really does bring together traditional and non-traditional security, security challenges. I think that's part of the complexity of our world now is we really can't separate these things. Um, and so obviously Seoul is, is understandably reticent to sort of directly challenge China's economic hegemony in the region, but it's new uh, Southern policy. And, and of course the, the joint fact sheet um, sort of linking the Indo-Pacific strategy and the new Southern policy does frame, it frames things in, 
in sort of positive values that it upholds rather than a confrontation uh, to, against what it negates, which is to say China's more liberal approach and, and use of technology. Um, I think this is the, this is the right framework. Um, Washington and Seoul are, are really close allies. Uh, we've been talking about, it, myself included, the threats that the alliance faces and the things it needs to do to upgrade, but they have very strong shared um, interests and both of them have robust industrial bases. And I think they need to work to, to sort of strengthen bilateral agreements um, to increase access to and collaboration in developing technologies and, and critical items. One potential model um, is the National Technology um, and Industrial Base, the NTIB. It maybe make Seoul a part of that, um, which is a very complex process, um, or establish similar bilateral mechanisms. Um, and I think they should really, to, to the extent that they can, is prioritize interoperability. Um, for example, you know, many Southeast Asian countries, and this is sort of more traditional defense uh, discussion, but they desire advanced defense capabilities, but they can't afford US technology is too expensive for them. They might prefer also a more nuanced diplomatic approach to China, and they might find you know, rock defense exports to be more attractive. I think if the rock can make this hardware more interoperable with US systems, uh, these exports would provide Southeast Asian countries uh, you know, the option to more effectively engage in security cooperation with the US down the road if they so chose. Um, so it's sort of laying the hardware, hardware groundwork now provides options uh, later. Um, and I'll just close by saying, um, you know, in a post-COVID world, and, and, and God hopes we'll be there soon, um, uh, countries are going to want to guard supply chains and, and even sort of reshore and onshore industry. And, and as other speakers have mentioned, domestic political and economic considerations are paramount. I think the ROC in the U.S. really need to better coordinate strategies because of that, because priorities are really going to be domestically focused. Um, and, uh, you know, as I said, and, and Jessica was alluding to, South Korea ranks near the top in technological expertise and manufacturing capability uh, in the world, as well as an in investment in R&D. And so I, I really think they need to collaborate. And people talk about the, the sort of asymmetry of the alliance, usually in the, in the sense that the U.S. is the bigger partner and Seoul the smaller one. Quite frankly, there are asymmetries where Seoul is leading by leaps and bounds. And I think the U.S. needs to recognize that, recognize that sometimes other countries and other people do things better than Americans do. And there are allies and friends, and we can work with them. Um, and you know, we face distinct budget and fiscal constraints, so we we have to try to find those opportunities. I've I've gone on way too long, so so I'll stop now. Uh, thank you, uh, Miwa. Please. Yeah, I um, it was great to hear uh, what Jessica and Clint uh, shared uh, American perspectives on this non uh, non traditional security challenges uh, that we, we we need to tackle together, and uh, it's it's great to hear that there is a domestic uh, movement from all stakeholders, not only the state and diplomats, and from the civil societies and companies and other uh, uh, private actors are uh, working on this uh, uh, issues. Okay, so I I I mean like. You, both of you addressed uh, quite a lot in detail, so I, I'm not sure whether uh, there is much that I can add, but uh, definitely, uh, you know, there are some areas, even in non-traditional security challenges, there are some areas that both of us can uh, share uh, share common interests, but there are other areas that the, co the two countries disagree with, right? So basically, um, for South Korea, I think this leadership change in America is a great opportunity uh, you know, to be a reliable and competent partner for America as initiative to rebuild and reshape, uh, uh, repair the damaged uh, international liberal order. So, um, but at the same time, uh, uh, the, 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 the discrepancies between these two allies has been, um, was not really during the uh, Trump administration because Trump administration didn't really uh, demand actions from South Korea uh, on a value, uh, on the basis of value or uh, the, the what's appropriateness, what's appropriate, what's, what should be done, right? So uh, South Korea in a way that had uh, some leverage uh, in terms of uh, uh, when it comes to the relationship with the China and then uh, North inter-Korean relations too. But um, so, um, so, but uh, under Biden administration, I think uh, South Korea should be prepared, uh, you know, to make a decision whether to whether it is willing to stand stand up 
with uh, America uh, when America Biden's uh, uh, tried to call China or North Korea or other non-democratic uh, countries uh, human rights uh, violations and abusive uh, behaviors and what's not considered appropriate uh, in international, in the context of multilateralism, right? So um, I guess um, um, when aligned action with principle in geopolitically strategic areas are required, South Korea really needs to face a tough choice. And then, and then the US, America, Biden admission, need, administration needs to devise a way how to persuade South Korea to to step you know sideline with uh, uh, America right to advance um, uh, Biden's agenda to rebuild democracy or consolidate democracy across the world so uh, but other than that uh, 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 South Korea and America has a lot of uh, a lot of uh, spaces to be cooperative uh, in, uh, especially in non-traditional security challenges. So they can start uh, all the cooperative uh, actions uh, in uh, more technical areas like pandemic uh, responses and also post COVID-19 uh, to, to rebuild or re re revamp uh, the global health in infrastructure or global health uh, system to deal with another potential pandemics uh, after the COVID-19 because currently uh, the, the existing uh, global health uh, system is inadequate and incompetent in dealing with uh, the, the, the global pandemic uh, so far. So, and also, um, and uh, these two countries can work on, uh, work, work, work together in, you know, to push forward the, the global climate actions, right? With more ambitious goals and with more concrete, concrete plans to meet the goal uh, by 2050. And also as Clint mentioned, uh, we can, we have a lot of, a lot of rooms to work in IT uh, infrastructure building, like how to uh, develop the 5G network or around the less developed countries and, uh, and so on. Like we can work as an alternative, reliable and uh, alternative uh, to Chinese uh, 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 digital technology, right? So, uh, at that being said, um, well, well, I I prepared a lot <laughs> in detail, but I'm not gonna go in go in there. So basically, I mean, uh, when it comes to COVID nineteen, uh, the pandemic uh, 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 pandemic uh, responses and also uh, climate change, uh, the first of First of all, America, uh, Biden said that it will come back to the multilateral, multilateral setting, right? So the Biden uh, said that it will be back to the WHO and then America is uh, now uh, one of the very few countries who didn't really, who doesn't really, who do, who do, who do not participate in uh, current COVAX uh, uh, mechanism mechanism uh, to develop and um, um, to develop vaccines, uh, adequate and effect effective vaccines across the world. So to ensure the, uh, the, the access, equal access from uh, the everybody, right? So, and then uh, wealthy countries and lots of advanced countries uh, are willing to donate uh, funds to, uh, to make this mechanism workable, but US has been out because Trump uh, refused to work with the WHO so far. And then WHO is one of the uh, three uh, the organizers of, organizers of uh, the COVAX, right? So the, first of all, you, you, America needs to be back on this system. And then even with the climate change, the same is true. The Biden said that uh, the, one of the first, uh, the movement that Biden made is, uh, we will be back to the Paris Accord. Right, he made this clear throughout his campaign and throughout, uh, in even in his uh, victory speech. Right, and then he appointed John Kerry, a former Secretary of State, John Kerry, as a, a special envoy uh, uh, for the climate issues. Right, he, John Kerry was the the one who signed and uh, uh, crafted and then uh, the the Paris Accord and signed the the Paris Accord. Right, so that that gives a significant sy symbolic message to the world that. America America will take the leadership in uh, global climate action one more time. So, uh, and uh, so within uh, that multilateral setting, then uh, we can think about more detailed uh, policy coordinations and how to, uh, you know, lead uh, 
uh, and then we need to show that uh, the co coordinated and concerted uh, uh, collaboration uh, on the world scene, right? So we need to really uh, commit uh, show the world that we are uh, we are uh, as an ally. We are on the same page with America for the uh, the for the for more universal values like uh the climate change and also uh tackling the global health uh, security issues so uh there are um a lot other more detailed policy uh the options and policy venues that we can discuss but i'm not gonna uh, go into uh more detail because of the time constraints thank you for hearing thank you miwa and uh thank you everyone uh we see some like similarities and differences in our ideas on the two topics that we discussed but i think we all agree that it's important to feed like fresh perspectives on the discussions uh that's set up uh so uh i think my role is done for today and i will turn the floor back to kuyan for her uh final thoughts kuyan please uh, thank you, Dr. Wu, for your excellent moderation, and I, I always appreciate for your efforts and help. And, and also, I appreciate all the panelists' presence uh, this morning in Seoul and pretty late night in Washington, D.C. I, I, I think I have to send you back to your bed <laughs> so that you can have a sleep. <laughs> as much as we discuss a variety of issues today about Iraq-U.S. Iraq alliances, I think uh, it seems like we have more uncertainty than certainty uh, during this transitional period, especially under the coronavirus situation. So in that sense, I hope two countries uh, continue to communicate with uh, each other uh, very tightly and narrow down the uh, kind of differences and uh, areas of conflict um, as we can sustain this good relationship of us rk uh, alliances. Um, and I think we have a long list of uh, uh, points we can discuss uh, together, but unfortunately we are running out of time. So I think we have to wrap up our uh, today's discussion. So. I uh, really want to say thank you uh, for your participation and I hope you stay healthy and safe for the rest of your day and good night for the American participants and thank you and uh, keep in touch. Thank you. <laughs>